This episode is brought to you by Blinkist, the mobile app bringing you key insights from each of over 3,000 top nonfiction books delivered via audio or short, punchy written blinks in 15 minutes or less. There are times when a high-resolution sensor can substitute for a longer lens, like this, taken on a 102-megapixel Fujifilm GFX 100S with a GF 32-64mm f4. But there are other times when nothing beats a great long lens for images like this. Taken with a bad boy like, well, exactly like this, Sigma's just announced $1,500, 2 plus kilo, 150 to 600 millimeter f5 to 6.3 DGDN OS Sports Telephoto Super Zoom. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And this video is going to be a little bit different from what I expect to see in most other reviews of this lens. Though I suspect, like other reviews, I will tell you that this Sigma DGDN OS 150 to 600 millimeter sport, available in both Sony and Leica L mount, is one heck of a lens. But here's how it's going to be different. First, I don't think it makes sense to talk about long lenses anymore in isolation from four salient facts. One, the arrival of high resolution sensors, call it 40 to 60 megapixels for full frame up to 102 megapixels for medium format this year anyway, means there are instances where we absolutely can substitute sensor resolution for lenses. We can, for example, crop in on a full frame camera and still have 24 or 30 megapixels worth of resolution at the low end, say going from 28 millimeter field of view to that of a 35 or starting with a 35 and cropping in to get the equivalent of a 50. And in so doing, reduce the size, weight and price of the gear we actually carry because we're simply doing without the extra lens or teleconverter. The primacy of sensors over lenses can be true for video too, a function of something as simple as switching from full frame to Super 35, the arrival and use of 8K, or in the case of Sony's 12 megapixel A7S III, which I'm using to record right now, the use of their clear image zoom. Which I'd fully intended to show you, except that after charging the camera and throwing it into my bag, I forgot to turn it off after having previously set power saving mode to off for long form videos. Oy vey. But before we go any further, I want to introduce you to the sponsor of this video, Linkist. Maybe you have some of the same problems I do, swamped by the constant noise and latest outrages of an hourly, sometimes minute to minute news cycle a desperate wish to rise above it all and to regain a sense of balance and optimism in the midst of the pandemic, a need to look beyond one's self for the wisdom, inspiration, and energy to make that happen. To which, I think, the answer can often be found in 
books. But who has the time for books anymore? This is precisely the problem Blinkist solves. I've been relying on Blinkist for much of this past year, an app for your smartphone which summarizes some of the best nonfiction books out there, more than 3,000 of them, each in about 15 minutes. Think of Blinkist as punchy audio and or written summaries for lifelong learners, with the option to download full-length audiobooks on the one hand, what they're calling shortcasts, audio and written summaries of some of the best podcasts out there, on the other. Like The Happiness Lab, with Yale professor Dr. Lori Santos, who in the very first episode, explores why we share photographs. Premium subscribers have access to full-length audiobooks at up to 65% off. I use Blinkist when I'm making breakfast, driving solo, walking the pooch, even, especially, mowing the lawn. It's an incredibly efficient and productive use of my time, and it could be for you, too. Just this week, I listened to Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, a professor of cognitive science and linguistics at Harvard. I loved his historical review of the 17th century era of enlightenment and his upbeat, fact-filled assessment of the power of and return to science, reason, and humanism. Because they're sponsoring this video, Blinkist will give the first 100 people who go to www.blinkist.com hue free Unlimited access for one week to try it out, cancelable at any point during that time, and 25% off if you want the full membership. Thanks, Blinkist. Let's just say that it's easier and less expensive today to ride Moore's Law and improve sensors than it is to design and tool for the physical world of autofocus motors, lens barrels, and aspherical, low dispersion, and or apochromatic lens elements. Three. One doesn't need high-resolution full-frame sensors to get more reach from smaller lenses. The 20-megapixel Micro Four Thirds sensor found in Panasonic's GH5, GH5 II, and G9, for example, allow one to bolt on the full-frame equivalent of a 100 to 400 millimeter f5.6 to f8, wide open, that is half the length, closed, and a third the weight of the new Sigma, allowing us to leave, even at the long end, our tripods at home and do it for the same depth of field at f2.8 and 4 respectively, eliminating most, if not all, of the advantages full-frame sensors have in low light. As in... Right. This little guy. Like is spectacular, same price actually, $1,500 DG Vario Elmer at 50 to 200, 2.8 to 4, used to create footage like this, handheld, racked all the way out to 400 millimeters. Finally, 4. With... The diffusion of computer-aided design and manufacturing to smaller companies around the globe, I've talked about this before, along with shorter cycle times between those new designs and rapidly evolving sophistication of geographically dispersed, lower-cost labor pools. Third-party lens manufacturers, most especially Sigma and Tamron in my book, have dramatically narrowed, sometimes to the point of obliteration, the advantage of original equipment manufacturers. At least when it comes to image quality, hold that thought. Second, our primary use case, our perspective here at Three Blind Men and an Elephant for evaluating this kind of lens, as you just saw, is atypical. While this new 150-600 is a ground-up, mirrorless-only design and part of Sigma's sports lineup, that is a reconceptualization of their previous 150 to 600 millimeter HSM lens designed for DSLRs, aimed specifically at mirrorless sports shooters and wildlife, for that matter. Neither is our jam. We are, first and foremost, street photographers, portrait and, in this context especially, urban landscape, with the occasional bit of reportage and video B-roll thrown in for good measure. In fact, for this test, I returned to my favorite real-world proving ground and my two favorite subjects for long lenses, New York City's Chrysler and Empire State Buildings. It is an extreme test, an acid test, because I'm literally shooting from just over one mile away and then cropping the crap out of the images to discern differences that most images will never reveal. This is a critical distinction to make for a number of reasons, beginning with the reality that we simply don't need the twitch-fast autofocus, wide maximum aperture, or 
ultimate reach that pro sports shooters, even amateur birders, need. Images like these, taken by my friend and professional motorsports photographer Stephen Scharf on a 24 megapixel APS C Fujifilm XH1, as I recall. Or these, from friend of the family and young enthusiast birder Ethan Hobbs, taken with another 24 megapixel APS C camera, the Nikon Z50, with an adapted AFS Nikkor 200 to 505.6. In other words, the very things, beyond image quality and weather sealing, that are required for these use cases are less important to me than size, weight, and not only value, but absolute cost. In a nutshell, I'm looking for maximum performance per dollar, per pixel, per pound, up to a moderately narrow field of view, and I'm willing to walk away if I can't get what I want. I don't want to spend, nor can I justify, as I once did, owning a $4,000 Canon 200mm f1.8, let alone a $13,000 Sony 600mm f4. And third, when I say image quality, I'm talking primarily about edge-to-edge -edge sharpness. I'm not going to evaluate a lens like this for lens flare, sun stars, minimum focusing distance, etc., because these simply won't be issues for what I shoot in any case. Further, although I did test the lens at various focal lengths, it makes no sense to me to shoot with a lens this big and heavy at the shallow end of the pool. I'd rather use resolution, cropping the crap out of an image shot on my Leica SL2 with my Sigma 85 1.4, for example, and settle, happily, for the equivalent of, say, a 135 millimeter, close enough to 150. Or, if I need more reach, carry the much bigger and heavier than the 85, but much smaller and lighter than the 150 to 600, Lumix S Pro 70 to 200. So, how good is this new Sigma for our needs, including how it compares to other lenses? At what point does the trade-off between sensor resolution and a lens's top end kink in favor of one or the other? At what point do non-lens considerations like weather, air quality, time of day, shutter speed, ISO, and support gear come into play? And at what point do size, weight, and cost transcend everything else? I'll just cut to the chase. The Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter f5.6 to 6.3 DGDN OS sports zoom is a well-built weather sealed monster of a lens that in the real world offers superb image quality, not only at the long end, which is why most of us buy lenses like this, but at intermediate fields of view as well, irrespective of price. To start, I'd say that at 600 millimeters and its maximum aperture of 6.3, it yields better images than Sigma's own 100 to 400 with 1.4x teleconverter wide open, the equivalent of a 560 millimeter at f9, and is as good or better than their 60 to 600 4.5 to 6.3 HSM sports. I'll put links to all of these reviews down in the show notes below. Which, as you might anticipate, means I'd rather not use the teleconverters on the 150 to 600 either. It's not that the image quality is terrible, but if your camera has enough megapixels and good enough video, using resolution in post and or crop factor at the time of capture, that is, switching to Super 35 APS-C mode, will always yield a cleaner image. Not only is there less glass in the absence of imperfections they otherwise introduce, you're shooting at the native aperture without the detriment of a one and a half or two stop decrease in light reaching the sensor, meaning all else being equal, a lower, cleaner ISO with which to work. I found this to be a big deal. Next, at 500 millimeters on my 47 megapixel Leica SL2, even with the 14 megapixel handicap it faces against the Tamron 150 to 500 mounted to the A7R4, it was fairly close in terms of fine detail in the center. But the Tamron did perform better wide open at the edges, and in this particular comparison, the Tamron also displayed less chromatic aberration. To my chagrin, I can't say with certainty that it was a function of superior lens design or construction, being shot on different days and times with different light, or my overexposure of the Sigma image, but my instinct is that the Tamron is marginally better at its top end than the Sigma is at 100 millimeters short of its top end. Then again, a little cleanup in post, and the difference is narrowed to the point of insignificance at normal size and viewing distance. At 
400 millimeters on my SL2. I'd say that in this acid test of eyeball peeling, pixel peeping from over a mile away, again shot on different days under different conditions, the nod goes to Sony's outstanding 100 to 400 millimeter f4.5 to 5.6 G Master at its top end of 400 millimeters mounted on the 50 megapixel A1. It seems to me that each of these lenses is optimized for their long end, and one could argue in any case that the fairer comparison would be the Sigma at its top end of 600 millimeters versus the G Masters at 400 millimeters. I understand. It is a reasonable point. Okay. The 600 millimeter on the Sigma beats 400 millimeters on the G Master with the usual caveats. But it is also noteworthy that at normal image sizes and viewing distances across the focal range, the Sigma is impressive for staying in the game. Which is important when you can't zoom with your feet and you're, you know what I'm going to say, viewing at normal size and distances. Still, the G Master is a third of a stop faster at the wide end, one full stop faster at the long end, these things matter, one third lighter and one fifth shorter, these things really matter too. But for those advantages, you do pay two thirds more than for the Sigma, which a number of us will be happy to do. At 300 millimeters, say it with me now, on these particular days with these particular set of conditions, the image I captured through the Sigma is better than the image I captured through Leica's Exceptional, as well it should be for more than seven large Apo Variant Elmer at 90 to 280, 2.8 to 4 at f4. I'm stressing the word I because I shot these more than two years apart under very different conditions, and back then, among other things, I didn't use a gimbal head or nearly as robust a tripod as I did last month. But it is what it is. The 12 megapixel limit of the A7S III was a significant disadvantage irrespective of lens when pixel peeping. But at normal sizes and viewing distances, taking an image from it as a whole rather than cropping the crap out of it to discern the fine detail differences, the performance of the Sigma 100 to 400, Tamron 150 to 500, and Sony 100 to 400 G Master still shone through. As I imagine, would the 150 to 600 and Sony mount. The big surprise, though it shouldn't have been, and to my consternation, I confess, because I love its small size, lightweight, and superb stealth, is that our go-to telephoto zoom these last several years, the Leica DG Vario Elmer 50-200 2.8-4 I just showed you, mounted on Panasonic's new GH5 Mark II, while acquitting itself beautifully at normal sizes and viewing distances, using the same field of view, and again, with the image taken as a whole, and a little help in post, was shredded by the Sigma 150-600 on my SL2, either full frame or crop mode, when I punched in. This is a function first and foremost of the SL2's more than twice as many pixels, but therein lies the rub. When will Micro Four Thirds ever reach full frame resolutions? When will it ever come close? This particular comparison demonstrates the point at which resolution, not the lens per se, is the gating issue. We can see the point again from the other end, here with the consumer grade, $500 Tamron 70 to 300, 4.5 to 6.3 at 300 millimeters. While even with lens corrections on, there is entirely too much distortion. The resolution of the A7R4 to which it is attached allows us to see very surprising and competitive sharpness. I can't tell you from firsthand experience how it compares to Sony's $2,000 200 to 600 but even with the caveats about MTF charts published by manufacturers being anything but apples to apples, I've looked at enough charts and compared them to what my own eyeballs tell me long enough to feel comfortable asserting that in the real world, say it with me now, at normal image sizes and viewing distances, differences in image quality will be insignificant and I don't know in which direction. On the other hand, A, I can tell you that differences in autofocus performance are more discernible. Even though Sigma is part of the L-Mount Alliance, Sigma lenses focus faster on Sony bodies than on L-Mount bodies. The difference between the two mounts focusing systems is significant. Sony lenses focus faster on Sony bodies than Sigma lenses do, but that difference, that is between a Sigma lens and a Sony lens on a Sony body, is less significant than the difference between Sony's hybrid phase detect autofocus system and the L-Mount Alliance's contrast detect only systems, DFD or not. On the other hand, I found that Tamron lenses generally focus faster than Sigma lenses on Sony bodies, closing the gap with native Sony lenses. 
I found that Sigma L-mount lenses lag Panasonic and Leica glass on Panasonic and Leica bodies, though I haven't tested the SL2S with the latest firmware. Though this doesn't matter in the ultra telezoom space because neither Panasonic nor Leica have a fully competitive answer to either Sigma. B. The Sigma 150 to 600 is big, especially racked out to 600 millimeters when it becomes just about 15 inches long and it is heavy. So big and heavy. In fact, with a concomitant shift in the center of gravity so far forward that my Arca Swiss Z1 ball head, this guy, couldn't handle it, couldn't hold it in place. And the built-in lens stabilization did not seem to make that much difference, which was another surprise. So I had to jack up the shutter speed all the way up to one four thousandth of a second in the middle of the day, which in turn meant I had to jack the ISO to 1250. And I am here to tell you that moving three to five stops off base ISO is enough to make a material difference to final image quality, at least when cropping or pixel peeping and looking at the finest level of details. But right, again, at normal image size and viewing distances of an image as a whole, all of these images look really nice and crispy. But the smaller maximum apertures and the inherent compromises one usually finds in telezooms are precisely why, along with much lower volumes and tighter quality control, bigger, constant maximum aperture lenses designed to excel at only one particularly narrow field of view, like Sony's 600mm f4 prime, cost the whopping 13k the Sony does and is worth it to a select few top-end sports and wildlife pros. Then again, as you may have surmised from my comment a moment ago about my heavy-duty ball head being insufficient for the 150-600 when racked out to 600, a gimbal head with a long plate is the only way to fly. It made a big difference, allowing for much lower shutter speeds and therefore lower ISOs. You don't have to spend much for one. I picked up the Oban GH30 with an extra long QR53 plate for about 230 bucks, and it did the business. This guy. All of which leaves us where precisely, especially given how close all of these lenses are, save for the Tamron 70-300. Though, hold that thought now that I've addressed the earlier thoughts I asked you to hold. If we talk about these lenses in isolation, then it's pretty straightforward. Sigma's 150 to 600 millimeter f5 to 6.3 DGDN OS Sports is a first tier ultra telephoto zoom lens with sparkling image and build quality near or on par in the real world with the best OEM and independent lens manufacturers out there. Compared to Tamron's 150 to 500, did I show you this guy? The Sigma offers a similar image and build quality with an extra 100 millimeters of reach. In turn, the Tamron offers smaller size, lighter weight, marginally better autofocus performance, and a $100 price advantage. Compared to its smaller 100 to 400 millimeter brother, the 150 to 600 offers significantly better image quality at the top end because its field of view is 50% narrower without need for teleconverters and the attendant loss of image quality and light. At which point, by the way, the difference in price is essentially a wash. When you add the cost of the teleconverter, $400 or $430 respectively for the 1.4 or 2X in L-mount, and tripod collar with foot, another $130 to the $950 price of the 100 to 400, then it ends up being $20 less expensive or $10 more expensive than the 150 to 600. Though it is much smaller and lighter than the big guy and therefore much easier to pack and schlep. Compared to its nearest OEM competitors in Sony's and Leica's lineups that I could get my hands on, the Big Sigma is an incredible bargain and notably smaller, lighter, and less expensive than its own HSM series DSLR predecessor, so bravo Sigma. Consider the Sigma 150-600 then as peerless at any price within the L-mount alliance and competitive with the very best within Sony's much more extensive lens ecosystem. However, if you haven't moved to full frame yet, don't intend to move beyond a full frame 400 millimeter field of view. Don't intend to crop the crap out of it and don't need 10 tenths autofocus performance. In other words, if you do the kind of work we do most often, I think the 150 to 600's most compelling competitor is actually not a full frame lens at all. I think it's still the diminutive Leica DG Vario Elmert 50-200 2.8-4 to 
mounted on a Panasonic GH5, GH52, or G9, especially since we already have it. I mean, look at what I'm talking about. But with this said, <sighs> there is no denying that the 50 to 200 is gated by the sensors of the Micro Four Thirds world with no indication that Micro Four Thirds resolution will catch up with the best of full frame anytime soon. And that the 150 to 600 on a Leica SL2 or Panasonic S1R, or one can infer on a Sony A1 or Sony A7R4, shreds it, butchers it, pummels it. You get the idea for ultimate reach and fine detail. Then again, our video-centric A7S3 couldn't keep up with the 50 to 200 on a GH5 too, at least not for stills. And to circle back for a moment to the budget end of the field, there is no shame in working within one's means by using the much more modestly specced and priced, sharper than you'd expect, $500 Tamron 70 to 300 lens, knowing that at normal viewing sizes and viewing distances, how many times have I used this phrase? And correcting the chromatic aberration in post if you're shooting in color, doing nothing in post if you're shooting in black and white, the gating factor will not be the lens or the sensor for that matter, even at 24 megapixels on say an A7 III, but you, us. All right, I'm almost done. Stick with me as I wrap it up. If you want to do something like capture up close, the two most iconic skyscrapers in the world, built within blocks of each other in the depths of the Great Depression, and which stand for those of us who can appreciate them as portals to the past filled with lessons about our present and the future, from mass culture to the role of women, labor, and capital. Well, find a big enough backpack to carry the Sigma 150 to 600 DGDNOS and a robust set of sticks and a gimbal head and a high resolution full frame camera to extract the most from it and sally forth. If you want to travel lighter and don't need quite the reach and are within the Sony world, opt for the Tamron 150 to 500. If you want even lighter and smaller, less expensive and more packable, Sony or L mount, the Sigma 100 to 400 is your answer using crop mode if you do occasionally need more. If you are all about sports or wildlife, go for the Tamron on a Sony because of its autofocus performance and both its lower price and extra 100 millimeters of reach compared to the Sony 100 to 400 G Master. But the biggest takeaway of all, the one thing above all else that I want to leave you with is this. Don't evaluate these lenses in isolation. At the distances I shot all seven lenses using eight different cameras in three different mounts across six different resolutions and probably as many tripods and heads in the last two years. At this stage in the evolution of lens design and manufacturing, that is in the post peak camera demand era where lenses have to be this good across the board at this level to get us to part with our money. Location, time of day, weather, freaking climate change. New York was blanketed on one of our shooting days by haze originating 3,000 miles to the west with the Argonne bootleg wildfire. A clear intention. Deciding just how much of a pack mule you want to be. Spending within your limits. And most importantly of all, just showing up are dramatically more important than the lenses themselves. Just saying, because they're sponsoring this video, Blinkist will give the first 100 people who go to www.blinkist.com slash hue free, unlimited access for one week to try it out, cancelable at any point during that time, and 25% off if you want the full membership. Thanks, Blinkist. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal or best of all, 
join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.